Hey, good morning. I'm just seeing if I have any audio. Sounds good. Okay, I can hear you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's uh, nine o'clock, and I'm just going to give another minute or so to see, uh, give everyone else a chance to get online. Excuse me, I'll take a phone call.
Hey, good morning, everyone. It's uh, 9.03, so uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. And uh, to do that, first of all, I'm going to ask uh, Mary Lee to uh, call roll for us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mary Lee. Good morning. Mary Lee, just as a quick reminder, everyone needs to um, have their cameras on and be on the cameras to be counted present. I will call roll and if you're present, just say present. Mike Billings. Present. Rashad Bristow. Jill Hano. Jill, Jill present. Okay. Uh, Bambi Poletzola. Coranda Corley. Present. Nicole Flores. Present. Selena Gilliland. Present. I wish. <laughs> and Liz Gary. Present. So you have a quorum. You have six members present and two members absent. Thank you, Mary Lee. Um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, go over the teleconference meeting protocols, and I'm going to just go through it quickly, um, try to keep us on track time-wise today. So council and committee members participating via Zoom shall be considered present when they display a live feed of their face and their first and last name on the feed. Everyone should have their microphones muted unless called upon by the chairperson. Everyone should electronically raise their hand or request the chair recognize them to speak. Once recognized to speak the chair, by the chair, their microphone shall be turned on. After speaking, the microphone should be returned to mute. Uh, during a Zoom meeting, guests may electronically raise their hand to request a comment. Upon being recognized to speak by the chair, their microphone should be turned on. After speaking, it should be returned to mute. Comments uh, posted, post comments relevant to the item under consideration in the chat box and staff will be monitoring uh, the chat box for us. So um, I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, we have our agenda before us and uh, really like to move through it timely today. So let's go on with the approval of the uh, October 29th meeting summary. Has everybody had a chance to look over that? Yes, Liz. Thank you, Mike. Um, yes, we, I looked over it and I just wanted to say a thank you, um, Marilee, for adding um, so many of the stuff that was discussed last time in this one so that we could review it since we didn't have it previously, obviously, because you don't do that. But thank you for adding it all. It helped a lot in being able to recap what happened uh, with the links, with the PowerPoint and the demographics. So I just wanted to say I really appreciate it and helped move forward for this meeting. Thank you. And I'll make a motion to accept these if um, this uh, the meeting minutes. Second. second. I will gladly second. Oh. Coranda seconds. And the summary is approved. So um, let's move on to um, the the next item is a recommendation to the council for the PIP uh, 2020 class. Um, and what I'm gonna ask everyone to, to uh, take into consideration is that we make a recommendation to the executive committee instead of the full council, because then we can move quicker on this instead of waiting until after the January meeting uh, for the council. It can be addressed with the next EC meeting. So let's move on and start the discussion about the 2020 class. Um, and also we need to keep in mind right now the current status of the, uh, the pandemic and the COVID, which is now uh, seems to be ramping up again. 
And, uh, you know, we need to keep into consideration whether we're going to do virtual or live. And I, I think right now it would be really difficult to, to move on a live class in, uh, you know, in the near future. So uh, let's go ahead and start the discussion on recommendations. Does anybody have any comments? Uh, I do. Um, I think it's only fair that the class missed out on so much. And if we're not sure if we're going to go live to plan and do something virtual to help them complete the whole class to make sure that they get, you know, the full breadth of everything and partners, I'd hate to go forward and try to do live. Something happens. They have to stop again when they're already coming together. They've had half the class and become, you know, more of a, a cohesive group and, give them a chance to at least, you know, be together virtually and finish everything. Corhonda, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I first would like to ask a question on if this class actually met in the month of March. Um, that's my first question. Yes, they did. Okay, so they meet the first weekend in March? They met the, the we met on the five, we met January, February, and March. The March date that was met was March 6th through 7th, 2020. Okay. okay, and my second question is, how many self-advocates do we have in this class? There are four self-advocates in this class. And the third question is, what is the total number of people that we have in this class? There were 17 people in this class. However, uh, in, uh, there is a requirement on the, con on, the, uh, on the acceptance that they have to participate in the January and February meeting. Uh, if, they're, if they miss the January meeting, then they will not move forward with the class and then if they missed the march meeting so there were uh three i think it's three participants that actually missed the march meeting but we know now with everything that has gone on they possibly had COVID, and we are glad that they missed it. okay and so, so we would we i would if I would have any recommendations, it, it would be that we do a, that we do a, uh, a I would say a, a, a reacquaintance because it's been a, a while with one session, and then we start with a, an actual recap of the virtual how the March session would go virtual so that those uh, participants actually can join the class back and not be penalized for possibly saving my life. Okay. Um, what I would like to um, like for um, like to be taken into consideration is I'm going to piggyback off of what Ms. Flory said that I think um, with the current status of the pandemic, I think that it should be a hundred percent virtual. It should be no in-person um, whatsoever. Um, just as a preventative measure. But I also would like to take into consideration what council member Lillian Dejan stated during the council. And we recruit more self-advocates to actually be a part of this class because it is now almost a year since this class actually met. So they're not as cohesive. Um, as I would, as we may want them to be. And I would also like to recommend that they actually start the whole entire class over so that it's a, it's a complete refresher, but it also will allow them the opportunity to become a cohesive unit. Well, I, I'll make a couple of comments and then I'll yield to, uh, I see uh, Selena is uh, if I'm, if if you don't mind me saying that, Selena, that you are a participant of that class. In my last uh, report, I did note that this class is actually cohesive. Uh, they have, they actually have a lot of subgroups and have extended help towards each other 
following the pandemic, including uh, those uh, participants that were affected by Hurricanes Laura and uh, Hurricane Zeta and all the other uh, things. They actually have a, have a unit that I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of, but they, they move forward. They have already bonded, let me say, as you would think any other class would bond without the help of Mary Lee or myself or any other, they, they have already established uh, what we would hope is a cohesive unit moving forward. That's my right. Opinion. Right, but my- and I'll give to Selena in uh, what she may actually feel as a participant. Now, if that is the case that there is an agreement to uh, to include others. I would have to yield to how uh, recruit the the guidelines for recruitment, and also give an establishment to uh, allow for uh, a connection to a group that's already connected. And, and that's no problem. I'm just looking at our federal guidelines, our federal DD Act in regards to how it's supposed to play, how everything is supposed to play out as it relates to self-advocates. And even right now on this ad hoc committee, we only have one self-advocate. So um, with it being a majority of parent advocates or agencies and not self-advocates, that's a problem. There's a there's a breach in us following and adhering to the federal DD Act. And so I just want us to continue to I want us to be mindful of that federal DD Act. And remember that it says it is supposed to create an inclusive environment for self advocates, self advocates, not parent advocates, self advocates, not agencies, self advocates. And so I just want it to be that we have more self advocates actually and partners in policy making because this is who it affects more than anyone else. It affects the self advocates. And right now we're not doing them a grave justice by muting their voices and not allowing them to actually participate in so many activities that are actually created for them. And I would just really like for us to include more self advocates. We don't even have people in the blind and deaf community represented. And I just think that that is a shame and it's a great disservice to them. And so with everything being virtual right now, it is hard for people in those communities to actually be a part of any type of democratic process that is going on. I really think that we have to be mindful of what that federal DD Act says because we are currently under three, three, three federal statements that has talked about removing our federal funding. And I just don't want it to be that we lose our federal funding because we cannot adhere to what the policies are actually requiring. So Thank I will now yield to Ms. Sheila. Selena. Selena, uh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see everybody. Um, so I, we have bonded and we have kept up with each other for the most part, not the entire group, but those of us who have, um, I reached out to them as well and let them know that we were discussing and I, I wanted to find out what they wanted to see happen because we're all in um, the same boat right now. And Completing it virtually, although it would probably be safe, would be really, really difficult considering we all have children that are going to be here in the homes with us. And it requires so much focus and time, even remotely when we're doing the partner sessions. I just can't see how that works when we're at home to be free of distractions and to actually be able to absorb the information effectively and not have so many distractions. You guys know it's hard to carry on business. Um, and I, I think it would be that much more difficult to do partners. It was really intense. It was a lot of information. Um, and, and we're all kind of on the same page. We'd love to do it in person. We realize it's not safe right now, um, but Ideally, 
everyone would love to do it when it is safe back in person. And if that means postponing or, you know, a recap virtually, then that would be good. I, I'm all for a recap. I feel like there's been too much time in between that whether we need to start it over from the beginning or do a, a recap virtually, something of that nature needs to happen because there's just been a huge gap. Um, but that's that's kind of our, our feelings as far as virtual versus in-person. It's definitely not gonna be the same if we did it virtually. I know it would be safe, um, but I think it would be hard and, and almost as hard, not just for our self-advocates, but for the parents that have really involved children it's going to be hard for us to carve out any space and actually participate the way you guys want us to participate, the way we want to participate. Um, so I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, I also feel like back on what Adrienne said, the, the three members that were dismissed in March, I definitely feel like they need to be reinstated. Um, I felt that way then, I still feel that way. I think it, now that we know so much more about it, it would be really irresponsible of us to penalize them um, for doing what was recommended at the time, which was staying home. And I'm really glad that they did. Um, yeah, one was my roommate. So I'm really glad that they stayed home. <laughs> but um, as far as, a 2021 class, I, I don't see how you can recruit. And I, I didn't get to read all of the transcript as far as where that landed, but I don't see how you could recruit or start a new class when there's so much unfinished for 2020. Um, and how that works out with funding and, and your requirements, I don't know. But I know that everybody in our class really wants to complete this class. And we want to complete it together and we want to complete it in the best way possible. Um, we only had those three months together, but we did bond and we did connect and it was great. And it would be great to do a recap virtually and see everyone. I just don't think that we would be able to participate at the same level as, um, as in person. And, and I don't know that it would, it would create the, relationship or foster the relationship um, that we were kind of on our way to with the whole group. Cause there really is just a handful that have stayed in touch um, since then. And I don't want that divide to be even more so. Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, let me, may I ask a question that would be directed to uh, Selena, but also a question for uh, Mary Lee and Jim, because and and how that question may be answered, you will understand when I ask that. Uh, when you when you're meeting in person, we uh, the uh, those parents have that have the opportunity to be able to be provided a stipend or that childcare uh, for uh, participating. So my question to you, Selena, which would revert to Mary Lee and, Mr. And, and Jim, is that if you were given or provided the same stipend for childcare, if you were, if you left home, if you were provided that same stipend to be able to participate virtually and give your attention to, would that, uh, help to provide you to be able to be able co to be concentrated because I understand uh, about meeting virtually I have my office door closed the phone you know it's I, I have to do a lot of getting everyone outside of, in, in my house prepared that I can't answer you right now uh, it just it just it's a blessing that my daughter goes to work when we're in meetings uh, so if you if your answer is yes to that question, then my question would be to Mary Lee and Jim, is that allowed? How do because that would be a that would be me presenting something new and I'm not sure how that works within the guidelines and the, the budget of how that, you know, if that is something that could be approved. 
this is Bambi. Can can I interject there? I mean, I just have to say, I don't think that that as a parent. I can't, couldn't isolate myself in my house, even if I had caregivers to where I could give the attention to the class. Like, and so, and my, my son is 21. And so I know we have some young, it's for younger parents. And of younger my, kids, my so. daughter is 23, so I could still other work. I mean, it may work for some people, but I can tell you the majority of people I know that, that well, I, I don't know how they can isolate you. themselves in their I'm house with their home. kids being cared in another what part for an entire weekend. I, I don't think that that's, practical, but Selena, I don't know what you thought, so on. Well, I was going to ask if, if that was your intention, Adrian, or if you were talking about a stipend for us to inv individually stay in a hotel or that type of a thing. Um, well, I was thinking inside the home, but to answer you, to answer or to, uh, to respond to Bambi, uh, when when we're presenting it in a virtual format, I think we we originally I was thinking that we would not uh, necessarily have to be focused for a whole weekend, but we can uh, look at that whole month to have time to respond, participate to the information that's being provided. So the information wouldn't just come at you where you have to sit down for the whole weekend and be a tool like we would be live in person, but you would get the information, you could get information at the begin, say at the beginning of the month, and then there will be like scheduled days where we actually may be able to visit together and respond. So when when we're converting to virtual, we have to take into consideration that we can't sit down for three days or two and a half days like we would be live in, in person, but to actually break that information up in a monthly basis. Right. The, the stretch for each session is long and intense. And we sat through some days, eight hours of lecture and I'm lucky if I can carve out two hours here. Um, I just, I just don't, I, I can't wrap my brain around what that would look like virtually. Um, and that's, that's just not even taken into consideration the um, networking and, and relationship side of it, which is huge. Right. And there's so much that we learned from each other after hours that you can't replicate virtually you know but I mean I think in a perfect world if this you know passed at some point we would all love to see it just start over once we get past this um, in person but I don't know how that works with um, I can't say that there are other states that are doing uh, the virtual, and I have modules from uh, several of the well, several of the states, and they they are meeting the challenges. Those that were meeting in person that are converting to converting to live. I'm actually in a discussion now with about four of the coordinators that are attempting to do or in or a little bit further than where we are in attempting to move virtual. And I think this they're considering this as that trial and error, error year to address the actual concerns to move to a complete, because they're actually looking at moving to a completely 100% virtual format for whatever reason, whether it's a large state where the geographical regions are much spread out or be it because of uh, being able to uh, accommodate the, to be able to accommodate more self advocates, which is something that was brought up. Uh, there, the 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 format uh, is allowing for a little bit more flexibility, even though it seems like it may be difficult at first. Thank you, Adrian. Liz, I've seen you had your hand up for quite a while. Go ahead, Liz. Thank you. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about my experience first in 2008 when I was actually a partner's um, a sitting in the class. And for those of you who sat in the class, I know that you can completely um, 
understand what Selena is saying. I 100% understand what Selena says because after being in the class for 2008 and then being the coordinator for almost 10 years, one of the most important things of all for the entire partners was for me was to make sure that they always had that in person because of the connection and bond. And going back to, um, you know, one of the reasons why like the January session was like that, because when you open up and that's where you meet everybody and that's where you connect on out, out the gate. That is like to me, one of the most important classes is the January, because you have that time to discuss who you are, what you are, what happened. And Selena is absolutely 100% correct about after hours. And everybody knows that, that after the classes were over, you'd go sit around and talk and connect even more. Um, another reason the March session was there is because one of the biggest things about partners is partnering with your policymakers. So if you don't make a March session where you're providing testimony and learning how to do that session, that was one of the reasons why we had also made that one a mandatory requirement because it was so important um, as the basis of the whole partners and meeting with legislators, understanding your testimony and the importance of it. Um, my suggestion last time was that we continued forward with the virtual for those in um, that were already in there only based on the fact that they had connected for three months. But like all you've said, we're going into eight months of no connecting. So that lost a tremendous amount on that. So I, I respect what Selena's saying with that as a parent. I also respect the fact that even if you were sitting at home, how difficult it would be virtual. I get that, that's, that's another huge problem. Uh, the bonding and the connecting at the sessions were one, it gave you the opportunity to get away and escape from the reality of your real world for a little while. Two, it gave you the bonding techniques, getting to know with everybody and, and truly engaging learning and not having to go back. It's one of those things where even if you lived in Baton Rouge, you were required to stay overnight because if you went home, you had to counteract all the information that happens at home, try to get connected and re-engage and come back. And so you lost a lot. So those who designed the partners program, Minnesota, knew exactly what they were doing when they do all this. This is probably the most heartbreaking thing for me because I'm seeing what has happened to partners, knowing the bonding and all that and the importance of it. I'm not sure after this conversation from my standpoint where I even stand anymore as far as moving virtual other than maybe doing some virtual topics for the class. Um, if we do move forward on virtual, then I do think that they could bring back in those who were ex who were not there for March and do a March session over virtual, which would give the opportunity for them to re-engage due to the fact that it was beyond their control, but give them the opportunity to have their mock testimony and learn what they lost before moving forward. Um, but honestly, at this point, I've heard all those and my heart obviously is most with what Selena is saying, because as a parent, I know how important it was for that bonding and that connecting and the fear of losing that. So at this point, I'm going to, I wanted to put all that information in, but I am at a loss, which usually doesn't happen as to how to move forward. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Liz. Uh, let's see who has her hand up now. Coranda. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm going to piggyback off of, off of Ms. Gary. I, my sentiments goes out to you, Ms. Selena, and your class. I know how important it was for my class um, with Ms. Flores and Mr. K Harlan Kauser, Mr. Dwayne Ebar, um, and several others being able to bond. That was extremely important, and it extremely broke our heart when Mr. Ebar, who was a self-advocate, was not able to complete the class due to the level of, due to the length of time of travel to come to Baton Rouge and how it impeded and affected him being a self-advocate with his disabilities. So... I, I definitely understand that, but I also understand that Mr. Kauser, who is a self-advocate, did complete our class, and, I, and I'm looking at Gia Haino, who's on here as well, that's a self-advocate, and I want more self-advocates 
advocates because that is something that is near and dear to my heart. That is also something that our federal DD Act speaks about constantly. And that is something that we are getting reprimanded um, constantly and consistently about, about our failure to be inclusive and diverse. And, and that is major. That is major. And I am speaking as a parent of a child that is medically challenged that has multiple disabilities. And when I see his community not being reflected in a class such as partners in policy making that is supposed to teach them how to use their voice, whether it is using uh, American Sign Language or it's using a, a communication device to speak for them or it's using Braille, I, I really, it, it pains me because I, even right now, as we discuss this, that's not even being reflected on this meeting. And so I want us to really take into consideration the legalities and the liability as it relates to if we were to allow this class to be in person. Because I don't think that that's something that we have taken into consideration. Who would be liable? Would it be the DD Council? Would it be the Partners in Policymaking staff? Would it be the Families Helping Families Center that actually have this contract? Who would be legally liable if we were to allow this class to go back to in-person meetings and someone contract COVID-19? Who would be legally liable? That's that's my first question that I would like us to have that we really strongly take into consideration. Number two, I get it. I started off this meeting with cooking breakfast for my child who's attending school virtual. And I allowed him to come and wave to everyone. I, I understand how hard it is and what the challenges are as a parent with having to utilize uh, any type of uh, platform such as Zoom or MS Teams, GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar. But with a class such as Partners in Policymaking, it's extremely imperative that we allow our self-advocates to actually have a voice and learn this material as well. It is great that parents learn it and that parents are taking advantage of it, but it's disheartening when our American Disabilities Act was done for people with disabilities. It started off with self-advocates fighting for that law to come into place. And so I just think that us not having, we have only four out of 17. And as Ms. Selena reflected, it's only a small number of people that have actually stayed in contact. So it's not as cohesive as we're making it. I think that we really should allow, open it back up just to self-advocates. I'm not saying open it up to everyone um, to be able to apply. I'm saying open it up so that more self-advocates can actually be able to come in. And yes, we, do, we would need them to do a whole refresher for the January, February, and March, uh, for January, February, and March class because it is almost a year. And by the time we get this up and running, it will be a year or past a year. So I think that that should be another thing that we take into consideration and whatever virtual platforms or plans that Ms. Adrian Thomas can cons um, has considered, I think that that should also come back to this uh, ad hoc committee so that we can make that recommendation to the executive council as well. That would be my considerations, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Corley. Uh, I wanna address something real quick and I should have done so earlier. Um, it's probably not appropriate for us to uh, speak about uh, who are and are not self-advocates. And it's one thing if you identify uh, yourself as self-advocate or your child as a, you know, that you're a parent of a child with disabilities and you speak about their disabilities, but we shouldn't be uh, speaking about the others' uh, disabilities. Okay, so... Um, Let's uh, just move forward on that. And Bambi, you have the floor. You have your hand up if- 
I'm sorry. I'll take it down. I, I already spoke. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments? I agree with what you're saying. I, I wish there were more self-advocates on there. When I first heard about partners, um, I wanted to be a part of it because I'm raising a self-advocate. And the moms that I met there, the dads that I met there, were all passionate about modeling that out for our kiddos. And they're all different ages. And, and some of them are more vocal and able to articulate and some of them are nonverbal. And, and it just kind of is a full spectrum, but that's how, that's how I look at it is I want my daughter to be a self-advocate and it starts with me. So that was why I applied for um, partners and I was so grateful to be a part of it. Um, I don't, I, I know that's not exactly what you're looking for, but that's, that's uh, everybody's heart is in the right place. Um, we want the best for our kids and we want them to become the best for themselves. Thank you, Selena. Um, I'm going to just interject a uh, comment, um, my personal ex comment here. Um, as a parent, and my children will never get to be um, self advocates. So they just won't have that capability. Um, and I would also like to remind everybody that in this agenda, we are you know, there's a class of 2021 that we're working on recruitment for. So we need to move forward with that as well and not necessarily go back to recruiting for 2020. So um, Jim had his hand up. Jim, I'll give you the floor. Okay, I, you know, as you know, uh, my son passed away some years ago and he would have never had the opportunity to be a self-advocate. But as this conversation goes forward, I wonder knowing a little bit about the past, it's difficult to get self-advocates to volunteer and to find them. So it may be more difficult than obviously four out of 17. Uh, there's obviously an issue there that it may be very difficult to get those self-advocates, that's all. Yes, I, I believe you're right. Um, Liz, you have the floor. Thank you, Mike. Um, yes, I will vouch for that for 10 years of uh, recruiting and trying to get um, applications. And it was very difficult to get self-advocates to apply. And there was a lot of reasons why. Um, one of them is if an individual with a disability was not living in a home and community with a family member who could bring them back and forth and they were in a group home or they were in another facility of something, it was very difficult to get somebody who would be willing to fill out the paperwork, one, for them. Number two, the other difficulty land, landed in getting them there. We worked, uh, we, I moved mountains to get people with disabilities there. We put them on buses. We got them to the bus station. I'd get an Uber driver to bring them. I had one year where I actually had an Uber dri driver I hired that took came every day, every Saturday to take them back to New Orleans to ensure that this person could participate. Um, you know, we would buddy up with certain, some people who were in the areas would be willing to pick up the self-advocates and bring them. So we did a litany of ways, but it, it wasn't, once we got the applications, we made it work. We made it happen. The problem was getting the applications. It's getting to the sources and the areas that where the people with disabilities are, whether it's People First of Louisiana or the individual ARCs, um, um, whether it's the, whatever it is, it's more of a recruitment issue than it is actually once we got them. Because if those people applied, they were the first ones we were looking at to ensure we got them in and found ways to get them there for sure. Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, one suggestion I might say is maybe what we do is temporarily in this conversation, because we're already at 940, maybe table what we're gonna do with the 2020 PIP class move to the 2021 class because I think that would give us an opportunity to seal what we can do, which we know what we can do with that because it's brand spanking new and we don't have to worry. And one of my recommendations for that is, is to do the informational regional sessions like we did in 2016 and actually hire the speakers we could actually hire the speakers, the same ones that did the regular partners, hire those to basically be an out 
to anyone that wouldn't be restricted to those who applied because that's what we did in 2016. We brought in Al Condalusi. We moved him to, I went with him in the Lake Charles. I picked him up in Lake Charles. We went to New Orleans. We had Charlene Comstock Galligan for education up in Shreveport. We had people in um, Alexandria come in, Sue Killam on it, based on what the areas wanted, based on what the areas in the state felt was most important. We used the speakers that were partners and brought them there. But you could also have that option of you're not bringing them anywhere, keep them on a virtual, and then you could run a January through Mar uh, January through June, just like you would normally, and introduce the same things and encourage people to get on every session and do what you can. Maybe not, you know. 10 hours on a weekend, but still at least give them three or four hours of each month of giving the same type of thing for 2021. That would be my recommendation for that. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Mary Lee, I saw you had your hand up. <clears throat> um, first of all, Liz, I just love that about you, that you got an Uber driver and all that type of stuff. So I just wanted to commend you on that. I'm trying to lower your hand. Um, I do just want to share you guys that we talked about a lot about these things at the last meeting and it was all put on the agenda. So we've spent a lot of time talking yeah. and it's important and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say it's because it's unimportant. It's just that we're talking about diversity essentially, which is item agenda eight. And we really, I really, really want this committee to decide what to do with the 2020 class. So we're on agenda item three, it's 9.45 like Liz said, and we haven't done anything with the 2020 class. This is also has to do with the contractual obligations. And I'll get to that whenever we get to that agenda item, but deciding what to do with this class very much drives the contractual obligations, which this committee shared was important to them about the council's contract with Family Helping Families and then FHF's contract with the coordinator. I also want to point out, we everybody has shared and I think all the input is very useful, but we have a committee of eight people and we have one person on this committee that was actually in the 2020 class, Ms. Gilliland, who, sh who shared her input. And then we have one person who was actually the coordinator for what, like the better part of a decade or over a decade, and they've both shared. So I don't know if as a group, I would just suggest that this committee kind of thinks about what they shared. Um, I think there's a lot of weight to put into what Ms. Gilliland said. Instead of a group making decisions for others, we have somebody here trying to make a decision for herself and her group. So I just want to redirect it because it would be really great if we had a recommendation to the executive committee on what to do with the 2020 class. So I don't know if you guys want to jump back to that. Yes, we do need to get back uh, on that. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. And we really need to get back on this uh, on track time wise. Uh, some of us have some other commitments today. Um, I'm sure, and I know I do. So um, let's uh, see if we can move through this quickly. Um, Jill Hanno, you have the floor. Can someone, Merrily Ebony, can someone share their screen with the agenda? To leave the agenda. Right, I'm just trying to figure because out. I didn't, don't camp a hard copy today. Yes, that's no problem. Just give me one second. Thanks. And uh, may, may I say something, please? Sure, go ahead, Adrian. Um, just going along with uh, what Mary Lee was saying and taking uh, uh, Selena, you know I'm thinking on my toes. As 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 everyone's saying stuff, I'm I'm thinking on my toes. Um, and also considering that there is a 2021 class, and considering what um, uh, Miss Corley has said, that we that the that there is a recommendation to move forward with the 2020 class virtually, and what 
did I mute myself? No, we can. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, and that we use that class, and I capture all the data, the the uh, good, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I will make every effort, uh, even if we have to do uh, subgroups within the group, like which is something that I have in a presentation moving forward that sometimes in your virtual group, you do have to go back and have a little small group discussions so that we can look at uh, taking the 2020 class, it will be an advantage because they have met already and they do have not just that they have a lot of, they have other subgroups that maybe Ms. Selena doesn't know about and uh, that we can, can just really capture that data. So when there is a 2021 class, regional or another whole group virtual class, and if it's a virtual class in 2022, and we are at any other time that we know the good, the bad, and the ugly about it versus doing it with a new set of people. So I, Jill, can you see my screen? It's very difficult for me to know what you guys see when I share. Yeah, we can see it. We can yes, see it. Ma'am, it's perfect. Don't do anything. We did. Our, oh, I'm sorry, Jill. Don't do anything. It's great. Okay. So we did. Doing it and I'm like, what is she doing? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to guess at what would be the best for y'all to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So we're on item three, and you can see after okay, that. I want to know why you're calling them. I don't my numbers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So does um, um, Adrian, your comments that you made, is that something you wanted to put into a motion form or? Well, I don't think, I don't know if I can actually make a motion within this group. I, I was just right. asking That's someone true. who could, would, would make, make a motion or move that the 2020 class does go on virtual, but it allows me and the class to capture all the pros and cons of meeting virtual so that we can address it moving forward for 2021. And that that's even if I have to have host two or three sessions within a month virtual or do networking two or three times within a month. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see who had their hand up first. So. And then Ms. Corley and then Jill. Excuse me, who did? Ms. Gary. Okay, Liz, she had the floor. Hi, Mike. Um, thank you. Adrian, one question. Did you say that they all um all the other classes went um virtual who were in the middle of their classes? They ended up going virtual to finish the other the other states. Did you say um, a lot of them? I can I let me not say all. Some are still they have, I think, one are two states that we were in a group a group email about five or six states. And I think one or two was asking just as myself, like, what are you guys doing? And they were like at the same juncture that we are trying to move forward. But I think the, the reason I put them a little bit ahead of us because they have, a, they have agreed to move forward virtual. They're just in that process, okay, now that we agreed to move forward virtual, how and what does that look like? So then they started reaching out, what does it look like for you? Okay, okay. So um, I will make a motion. I will make a motion that the 2020 class moves forward with a virtual format. Um, I will also add that those who were in, and I don't know if I can be this specific, but I think I'm just going to throw it out there. Those who were in the March session, but not allowed to return because they were ill or because they couldn't, that they are accepted back and that um, the March session technically would be repeated so that they can get that full effect and move forward. Okay, so, and Liz, let me just ask you, is this motion for consideration of the executive committee? Yes, absolutely, yes. And that, that the motion, yes, I make a motion that the executive committee um, 
reviews having the 2020 class go virtual with those from March who were not able to attend because of the illnesses be allowed to repeat or be allowed to stay in the class and they'll repeat March class and then move forward with the remaining classes. Okay, thank you. I would also like to add, and I don't know if I can add it to the motion or if it's more or less just the thought process. I would like to consider um, based on funding once this occurs, if we are able to go back live, that there's some connector for that class to be able to come together, even if it's just for one weekend to meet, re-engage, and even if it's up on just how to connect after COVID pandemic or something to that effect, that they have that opportunity, even if we move forward with future classes that they still get because they will have lost so much that they still will have some connectors. So I'd like to, that's probably not part of the motion, but I would like that to be considered by the executive committee moving forward. So Liz, if you want, I can read your motion and then it might just be cleaner to make a second motion with that second piece. Okay. And I think you guys can see what I'm typing. Um, mm -mm. No, we don't see what you're typing. Okay. The executive committee reviews the PIP 2020 class going forward in a virtual format and those absent in the March session are accepted back and the March session is repeated for all. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, I'm not sure who I didn't catch. That who. was Nicole, I think. Yeah, okay, Nicole. thank you, Nicole. Uh, there is a request to put the motion on the screen for people to read. Okay. Oh, thank you. I'm not um, monitoring the comments. Yeah, we need to see if there's any. It's uh, so. pertinent to the uh, item on the floor. Mr. Chairman, I would like to amend that motion to have to have it include that that class do a complete refresher of the January and February sessions since due to the uh, time frame in which has been delayed for that class to actually resume. I thought the uh, refresher would, I, I was assuming, and I'm sorry, Ms. Curley, I, don't, uh, I was assuming when we did the refresher, I would include January and February, so I'm not sure if that's, I don't know if you want to include it as an amendment because it was a it was already a, a indirect directive for me to do that when, when I communicate with them. I was gonna do it anyway, put it like that. <laughs> so um, Liz, would you uh, allow a friendly amendment to your motion to capture that language? Say that again, just a review, Coranda. Is that what you said? Just a review of the January and February sessions? Yes. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think that probably would be a good review for them. And Nicole, does your second still carry on that? Definitely second. <laughs> All right. So do we have any uh, public comment? Would it be possible to, to survey the others in our class, just to make sure technology capabilities and and that virtual is an option for everyone involved. I think we have that on the agenda. Excuse okay. me. Um, I think we have that further down on the agenda. Um, if I recall correctly, let me get back on my other screen. I'm not sure if that's on the agenda. Oh yes, that is. I'm yeah, sorry, item right. seven in the agenda. So is item seven in the agenda is 2020 uh, partners policy making uh, virtual accommodations. If you don't mind, Mike, can I just read this amended motion? Yes. So it's on the record and we make sure it's what everybody wants. The executive committee reviews the PIP 2020 class going forward in a virtual format and those absent in the March session are accepted back and the January through February sessions are reviewed and the March session is repeated for all. Okay. Yep, that looks good, Marilyn. Okay. okay, do we have any, uh, any comments? 
Yes, Mike, you have a, a comment from Harlan Kauser. He says, please also consider additional virtual options to allow participants to share some social activities as well. Um, he also says that I am a very proud self-advocate and I strongly recommend that more self-advocate participation be promoted. And that's all for now. Okay, thank you, Ebony. So, um, we can uh, move this to a vote. Do we have any objections? Okay, so if we have any no objections, we will consider the motion carried. No abstentions. Do we have any abstentions? Sorry, thank you. So the motion will carry. Okay, thank y'all for that. And let's, uh, we're gonna move on to item four and we are right at the 10 o'clock mark. So we were an hour into this and we have an hour left. Um, so item four is a recommendation to, and I'm gonna change this to, uh, ask that y'all consider changing this to a recommendation to the executive committee for possible partners of policy making informational regional sessions for 2021. So uh, here's where we're gonna look at what uh, the objectives are for the 2021 class. And if we can try to uh, move quickly through and get something together using the information we talked about for the 2020, because um, it would kind of blend it in at times. So the floor is open. If, uh, if anyone has comment, please raise your hands. Yes, Adrian. Uh, just referring back to what Ms. Curley said and what was what I presented at the October meeting, I would, uh, if someone would consider a uh, moving that there is a, a regional or 2021 class that focus on those schools, those post-secondary schools in Louisiana that have programs for students with disabilities in the inclusive program. Okay, thank you for that. Anyone else? So I might just suggest that Liz, um, maybe back to this, because she had kind of started the yeah. discussion. And yeah, and Liz just had her hand up. So Liz, go ahead, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, I would just um, once again, think about the whole regional um, positions instead of moving forward and looking for a new class because you're not even going to be able to start them out and give them any any similarities to what a class would look like. Um, because if you're meeting virtual, then that's gonna be very difficult to connect and bond um, through that, plus the amount of hours and time that's supposed to be done to truly say that you are partners in policy making graduate would be an entire year of pretty much going, you know, many hours every, I mean, obviously if you can't put it all in an eight, what, eight hours one day and eight hours, so 16 hours in each weekend, you're gonna have to break that out over you know, the, the 108, 60 hours, I believe it is over the course of a year. So I think that to abandon the idea of a 2021 class and strictly move forward with the regional workshops or whatever you want to call them, they're not going to be regional, actually, they're just going to be virtual meetings presented by the partners in policymaking. I don't know that you're going to be able to call it partners in policymaking, which we did not in 2016. We just said we were having a regional workshops and use the dollars that were available for partners in policy making that next year to do that. But I think that you could have some powerful impact getting some of those um, Guy Caruso, Al Conda, Lucy, Deborah Whitfield, all of these different ones. And what you're also going to accomplish is if you get out to these people there who want ne all next year to be on these virtual seminars, learning what's going on, you're going to have those that are going to strive for more. And so when we can go back live, I believe you're going to end up with an enormous amount of recruiting uh, that will be there, that will be able to touch many more 
uh, lives than we have in the past from a recruiting standpoint, because they will see what they what has happened and they will want more. And at the same time, you can be working for that year. And I'm happy to work with Adrian on that, on how to not only recruit, but how to make it appealing to people who may have concerns about how am I going to get there? How is this? What can I stay by myself? That kind of thing. And to reassure families, uh, I would even say like every time that there is a seminar that's presented, present what the potential is for the following year when we go live and who can apply and what the offerings could be and what it is. A lot of people to this day still don't know the full impact of partners and that not only is it a free thing, but the amount of information you give, the amount of empowerment and the amount of knowledge. And if they knew that, understood that, I think you'd have a lot more willing to do it because of what you end up coming out with. We have an enormous amount of PIP graduates that have gone on to be very in great places and done great things. And I think it's um, important that this would give us the opportunity to do a lot of what Karanda was saying, make sure we're touching those people that we haven't been able to touch, getting out there and finding them so that the following year, if we're back live, we can maybe have a hundred applications instead of getting 35 for a class of 25. That's, and and I'll, I'll open it up, but I'll make that recommendation if nobody else has any other comments. Those were great points, Liz. Uh, Mary Lee. I'm sorry, Liz. I was um, like dealing with the game on the screen. <laughs> can you just like, what's the quick version? So I can just type it in the notes. Or maybe if you just, I don't know if you want to make that recommendation, then I can type that. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to make that recommendation. I make the recommendation that the uh, 2021 moves forward with a virtual format open to anyone um, who would like to join in um, the recommendation to the ex executive committee that it would be a virtual format in 2021 that anyone be able to join. I recommend that we use the speakers that are partners, speakers based on the topics and give them um a whole partners for a year and give them the capability of seeing what it is in a virtual format in a shortened version so that they have the opportunity the following year and used it as a recruiting method also. I know that was an awful lot, but basically in a nutshell, recommendation to the executive committee to move in a virtual format with, a, uh, with the speakers and the topics that are normally held in a partners uh, program. Does that help? Yes. If you could put that on the screen just so I can reread it too and everybody else can see it. Thanks. Mary. I'm sorry, Ebony and I are- um, No, that's okay. I, 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 I get you're sharing the screen. Hmm. Um, one second. Thank you, Ebony. I'm sorry. Okay, so Liz has a motion on the floor um, to recommend to the executive committee a virtual format in 2021 open to anyone who would like to join in recommending using the partners policy making speakers based on topics and give them an entire PIP class for a year in a PIP format, which will also work as a recruiting tool for next year's applicant pool. Do we have a second to that motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a friendly amendment to that um, for it to include a little survey at the end of each uh, each session so that we can collect data to see what um, populations we're actually reaching. Populations are demographics that we're actually reaching. So I don't know, I think that may be better as a separate motion. I'm not sure. You would uh, just have to tell me how to type that in. 
I, I don't know how to combine that. And yeah, that's. Mr. Her Chairperson, this is Bambi. Um, I would like to second Liz's motion, and I agree that Karanda's motion could probably be a set would be better as a as a separate uh, motion. Um, if that's not already a requirement, in, is that not already a requirement, Marilee? That uh, we have data from our program. Right. Yes. Yeah, so you'll see most of what's a requirement if you looked at that demographic representation of the selected applicants for the 2020 PIP class, which I shared. Um, it is self-advocate or parent advocate, so advocacy representation, geographic representation based on our regions, gender representation, minority representation. And then I think we try to do rural and urban, um, but that like kind of proved difficult because when people fill out an application, they don't know if they're rural or, or like what's the guidelines on what's rural or urban. So we would just kind of look at the regions. Okay, so um, I don't wanna get off too far off track here. So, we currently have a motion on the floor and it's been seconded by Bambi. Do we have any comments? I think it's, Jill had her hand up first. She's been okay. trying to comment. Jill, can Jill, you have the floor. I, I'm sorry, I can't currently in my view, I can't see who it's has hard. <laughs> I don't think this pertains to on the motion, but do I have permission to get it out because I'll forget. Sure. Um, Go ahead. If we do the 2021 virtual um so our council COVID protocols instead of a two-day format, we're doing our format over essentially a three, four, five day period. So and again, it is a 16 hour session for partners. Can we expand that into like a three, four, five day period as well? And kind of mirror the format the council meeting has kind of adopted just food for thought. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Jill, and I think that's something that they would have to work out when they actually get around to uh, uh, developing the format of the class and scheduling the classes. Um, Mike, can I say just one thing about that real quick? Sure. That was kind of what I, where I was going, Jill, is instead of trying to put everything into a one weekend, 16 hours, by spreading it over an entire year, you're giving the pieces to them throughout the year so that they'll have the different information and not have to sit for one, in, one weekend is kind of what I was thinking. Is that what you were asking? You're muted, Jill. Jill, you're on mute. Sorry, my touch screen isn't working. 
properly, but because you, Miss Liz, you said some. I uh, know, Liz. You said something about how many hours is it per year? You said. I want to say it's like a hundred and sixty in that ballpark. I believe that you're supposed to do for the class. So you would say, because what? I was getting and wasn't necessarily what you said, but now I'm thinking, so did you mean like spread the 160 hours out? through the calendar year? Yes, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be the amount of hours that the partner's class is because you're not going to be able to use the partner's name doing this unless the partner's program allows that specific change. So it would be more like you would be doing a mock type of partners to give them the feel with the speakers and stuff, but not necessarily even coming close to the 160 hours because it's just with everything that needs to be done. It would be more about giving the speakers, the main speakers, the main information to the family so that they can, and the self-advocates, so they can know what's going on. Does that make sense? Yes. And I really, I like, there's just so many as that because I, as much as I love that idea, Again, we're hit with the bonding as pet. And another question I did have, you said that um, we did have the March Partners class, correct? Hello? Jill, yes. are you asking Adrian? So, thank you, I'm bad with names. So, um, y'all went to mock testimony? Okay, so, um, very glad that, I mean, this is gonna sound horrible, but I don't mean it to sound bad, but I'm very glad that the two most essential, um, the bonding in the public testimony, like, um, so glad that we don't, y'all didn't miss that because those, they're, they're all pivotal, but those are the two most crucial ones. Thank you. I agree with you. I'm glad that we were able to make it to March. Uh, it was unfortunate that some of our members were sick at that point. Um, so I think it's great that we're gonna redo March, um, but I think it's a great idea that to do these kind of regional education days to kind of familiarize everyone with what partners can offer. And I think it'll be huge. It just needs to kind of differentiate between this isn't an actual partners in policymaking graduate versus you know, just regional sessions and education opportunities. But I think it's a great idea. I do think um, what with Jill was saying about the time allotment, I think that's gonna be an issue as well for the 2020 class. I don't see how we're gonna be able to do 
eight hours at a time virtually, but I'm sure we'll figure something out. I just didn't know if it's an option for it to be spread out over additional months um, so that it's not so much virtually. Thank you, Selena. Um, I see we have a couple of hands raised and um, see if these are pertinent to the uh, motion on the floor. Uh, Bambi. So I just want, well, just to respond to what Selena said, perhaps if we go with this, you know, um, virtual option open to everyone in 2021, but it, it wouldn't be the entire class. It'd be kind of like highlights or snippets, you know, like particular sessions, perhaps the partner's class could participate and you know if it's a two hour like training session then you have your own like really like you know tight type thing that you you do together um to expand upon those issues that might be a way to you know to help um uh, move things along um and i just i put a, a, a just a couple comments um about um you know the way we can promote it i think that this is a good way uh, based on what liz said that um we could have um, partners, grads, and, per, and presenters do video commercials to, to, and I put commercials in kind of quotes, but like, you know, just kind of Facebook commercials to talk about how great partners is and how this is an opportunity to get this information. Um, and also it gives an opportunity for more self-advocates, I think, to participate, but at the same time, get their support staff or their support, whether it be family, um, waivers, waiver um, service providers, or I'm thinking about like my son goes to the UL Life program. And so maybe have those students participate. We could have a partnership there um, and have their mentors participate with them and support them. Um, so it's a great way that we can reach people who normally don't have access to, um, to partners because they don't meet the criteria that partners requires you to know, meet to be a, a, a participant. Thank you, Bambi. Uh, great points. Uh, Ms. Corley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and my comment is related to the motion that passed. Um, just like I, I agree with Ms. Polazola that yes, I am full in agreement with the motion, but I also think that we should collect data um, just like with Families Helping Families or any other webinar that um, is allowed accessible to the public. They actually do a little survey, um, whether it's with registration um, that they, for the person to attend the webinar, they collect data to find out if the person is a person, is a self-advocate or a parent of a child or a person with a disability or a worker with a person with a disability. We, I think that it would be pertinent for us to collect data so that we could see what, um, what demographics we're actually reaching um, with this actual uh, partners in policy making highlight. So that way we would actually have a nice database to show those demographics, as well as we would have those individuals emails where we can do a follow up and actually send them the information when we actually want to move forward with a real class so that we can actually extend that invitation to them and inform them that, hey, we have a new class coming up and here's the application and the process. So I think that if we do a little survey, whether it's at the beginning um, or if it's included in the registration some type of way for the PIPs highlight, it would actually allow us a much greater pool of individuals that we can actually reach to become participants in the partners in policy making. Thank you, Ms. Corley. And um, after we finish this motion, perhaps you would like to put a motion on the floor that would cover that. Um, so we have any more discussion on the motion or any public comment? I do. <laughs> Jim Sprinkle? Yes, sir. I just like to, I'm, I like what's, what this is because it opens up another door that I'd forgotten about or hadn't even thought about, but it's been alluded to. If you have a, a speaker that's going to be speaking on a particular subject, that could be marketed throughout the Families Helping Families network and make it uh, available 
for the general public to be able to listen to that one speaker and actually register or not register or you know do whatever you do for that but i see a great potential for that reaching great numbers of people at one time and maybe just for that one speaker or this speaker not the whole program just because they are that those speakers are so important and and they get their thought across so well liz would you agree Absolutely, Jim. That's what we saw after the regional 2016 sessions when we tra when I traveled with the speaker with the uh, speakers. It was a great opportunity for those who can't get out, and we also got one or two for the next year that came. But if we push it hard enough, recruit hard enough in a virtual world, right now we have every opportunity to be able to get that information out there and get to those people. But yes, I agree 100%, Jim, because it will give. Um, I know Susan loved Al Lucy, and she was so glad that we were able to bring her to that area. So this is going to be somebody who's going to be virtual that these people can join in. So I think it's going to be fabulous. Right. And Liz, I, I'm sure you could probably give us an idea how many former graduates have asked you to come back and, and sit in classes and you told us no. <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so we would love to hear those speakers again. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you. I want to hear them again. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm missing. laughs> Yeah. Um, so do we have any uh, any more public comment? There are some comments in the chat, Mike. Would you like for me to read those? If they are pertinent to this, yes. Yes. Um, Constance um, from uh, YouTube says she's she loves the idea, Liz. Um, Bambi already um, stated her comments. Harlan. Kauser says the virtual option will allow the program to reach people with various disabilities. Um, Ms. Selena says, I agree that a survey for each virtual session will be a great indicator of the demographic info we are trying to capture. And I think um, Mr. Harlan also says, I agree about the survey. The survey is a great recruiting tool and that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we had the motion and we have a second and we've had our uh, discussion and public comment. So do we um, have any objections to the motion? Do we have any abstentions? Okay, well that motion will carry and will be presented to the executive committee. So thank you, everyone, and uh, we can move on to our next agenda item, um, item five, and I believe Mary Lee is going to update. If I'm motioning, you know me. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to give Miss Corley an opportunity if she wanted to bring her motion onto the floor. Can I abstain from the current motion? because I can get off and didn't hear what y'all said. So can I abstain? Sure. Thank you, sorry. You noted, please, Mary Lee. Yes, I, I got that. Okay. So, um, Karanda, um, I'd give you the opportunity for the floor if you want to bring forth the motion that we talked about earlier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion um, that for um, for our partners in policy making highlight that we um, present some type of registration um, or a little survey before or after the uh, the presentation to collect the data to allow information to be disseminated to those individuals in regards to the future partners and policy making class. Okay, let's ask Mary Lee to share that with us when she has a moment. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's motion on the floor from Ms. Corley to present a registration or survey before or after presentation. Uh, that's talking about the virtual presentations to collect data to allow information to be disseminated to individuals for future PIP classes. Do we have a second to the motion? I'd like to, uh, can I ask a recommendation? Oh, or Liz, Liz? No, I just had a question. Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Liz, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. to, to be cemented to two individuals, Coranda, what individuals? You mean like the people who are gonna be choosing for the next class? I'm just not clear on to be seminate, disseminated to individuals for future PIP classes. Who's the individuals? Is that the public or that's the the executive council or the committee uh, council members? No, it would be to the public. So the survey is for the public that's um, gonna that's registering to attend the partners and policy highlight that we just uh, passed a motion on, okay. and we would send we would be able to capture their email addresses through this survey along with their demographics. Um, such as like if they live in a rural urban area, if they're a self-advocate um, or a parent advocate, and we would ask them in this survey if they would allow, if they would like um, information regarding how to apply to be in the next, in the future partners in policymaking class. And so this would give us a much broader, um, a much larger population of people that we can actually um, recruit to be in the next partners and policy making class. Got it, thank you. Okay. So I don't know if you wanna read it again. I changed it a bit. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to uh, read it again with the clarification. Okay. So um, the, I'm gonna read the motion. Um, the motion by Ms. Corley is to present a registration or survey to participants in the virtual presentations, either before or after the virtual presentations to collect their contact information and data to allow information for future PIP classes to be disseminated to these participants. Do we have a second on that motion? Uh, well, Bambi mentioned in the chat, the survey might already be merely a requirement that we just aren't uh, knowing about. Yeah, and I think uh, that was alluded to that uh, we do complete a uh, survey for participants in the classes, but uh, I think this is more specific to the version. <laughs> so it might be um, just to share information on that, Ms. Flores and Liz will remember and Adrian will remember. So when people apply for partners on that application, they put this information, um, which I read before. And it, I think it's more than what I'm reading here, but it's at a minimum, their contact information, their advocacy representation, their geographic representation, their gender representation, and their minority representation. Um, so it might, for consistency, be easier and make it cleaner if it was just kind of those exact same questions mirrored for those who register for the virtual presentations or something like that as opposed to making a second data set. And then that's gonna be hard to compare if that's something you choose to do with the data later down the road. I, I don't have a disagreement with that. I just wanted us to capture um, the information so that we would have more individuals that we can actually um, allow, present, applications to so that they can actually apply 
for the future partners and policymaking class since this is going to be um, virtual uh, partners and policymaking highlight presentations. And and I, and maybe I should yield this. Maybe I should ask the question to Mr. Sprinkle. Um, is it a requirement before um, for the or um, for the families helping families to actually collect this information? No, all families up and families would do would be maybe share on the website, uh, market it. Person is going to speak at this time and how to do it. Uh, that would be very simple. Keep it simple. And for those people that don't aren't registering to, for the full class, keep that application extremely simple. Like uh, give me your email address or something like that. Otherwise, people look at we want to fill out this form and they're going to eh. So keep it simple so that people that uh, would look at it from an outside viewpoint. I know sometimes when I uh, go through seminars and I have to register and I have to go to two or three pages of questions, I get irritated. So we'll make it simple for the people that just there to see that one person. But, you know, make one contact such as email address so you have the ability to email them back and ask those questions. So it doesn't disturb that immediate first impression on their part. Mr. Jim, I'd have to agree with you. Um, it's sort of, I mean, it's six to one and half a dozen the other. You can either put it on the front end and then some people may get turned off like you said, or a lot of times what we do is after something is completed, you send out like a post session survey and you might get back half of them you know what I mean because again somebody's not going to if they don't want if they don't want to be bothered with it they're not going to fill it out once they get it after that informational session ends so that's just information that I'm glad you brought up Mr. Jim because I didn't think about that but that's information really for you Ms. Corley and the committee is that and we can certainly do this and I think it's a great idea but I would just urge you to keep in mind that you can, I cannot, nobody can force people to give you their information if they're not going to. Oh, no, ma'am. I, I just don't want it to be, I, no, I want it to be super simple. Maybe two, three questions like, hey, are you a parent or self-advocate? Number two, would you like, um, would you like more information in regards to our partners in policy making um, class? And number three, is it okay that we email you um, that information when we're opening up our process uh, to accept applicants? So that's and a that, little different from what I heard you say the first time. And it, maybe it, I misunderstood. I thought I thought you wanted their data, like. No, because most of the time when families open families have their um, registration um, for any of their webinars, they actually have you disclose if you're a parent or a self-advocate, um, your race, ethnicity, um, your income, et cetera. So that's what a lot of the partners and policy make. I mean, a lot of the uh, Families Hope and Family Centers already have um, with the, when you're registering for their webinars. I just want us to be able to, to disseminate the information on when we're gonna have when we're gonna actually be accepting applications if we can collect the information from them saying, you know, if they are a parent or self advocate and, you know, so that we can, because this, this is like, we've already said, this would be a window that we would have to reach more self advocates than anything. So we need their information to be able to forward them the application when we're actually recruiting. So, so this is our way of capturing it. All you need is the email. Right, yeah. And the email, that, really, that'll work. You don't have to ask them if they want to know about it later. You can just let them know. So no, do you want to read the motion, your motion and, and change that language? Because it still doesn't have a second, so you can still do that. Do you see it on the screen? Yeah, but I just also read a comment from uh, Ms. Polozola. Ms. Polozola, can you elaborate? Because I don't want to make it more complicated than what than what everybody is making it. I just really want simple questions. 
like really simple question. Can we have your e email and then let us just email the they information out? You your, they have to give you their email. If you're gonna- Yeah, gonna so I, that's what I was gonna to say now, like when we got on to register just to be on this meeting, uh, we had to put our email in. So like like Zoom collects that because you, you had to log in. So you get that email, but I know anytime I've gone to like family self and families events, there's that little satisfaction survey. And it, like you said, it gets that data. So it's not, it's not anything new is what I'm saying. Like we do that type of thing already for years, um, collecting, you know, the simple, like little, you know, data points that, that they need for, you know, whatever reports that are being done. So I think that's what, what you're saying, that we're trying to just find out if we're, we're um, touching those um, uh, groups that we know that we've had difficulty interacting with or had less interaction with um, over the years. So what I'm saying is we already do that. We have those things already in place that we capture that information. We just need to use those tools for this. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Polazola. So I would like to change my motion so that my motion Corley, can re oh, I'm Ms. sorry. Um, just one, before you reformat your uh, motion, um, I would also ask that you uh, consider making it for the executive committee to consider. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I would like to change the motion To read for the for the executive committee to consider a satisfaction a satisfaction survey for participants in the partners in policy making highlight. Okay, so you just want it to be what's already done. You just want to make sure that's still done? Correct. Okay. I'm just going to type what I think is your goal and then we'll read it. Executive Committee to consider a satisfaction survey for participants in the PIP regional virtual sessions that captures participants' demographic information. Made by Ms. Corley. Is that, am I getting it? Okay, I see her nodding. Okay, um, so I'll read the uh, motion. Um, the motion on the floor is for the executive committee to consider a satisfaction survey for participants in the PIP vid regional virtual sessions that captures participants' demographic information. The motion is made by Ms. Corley. Do we have a second? A second. Um, someone seconded, but I did not. Ms. Ms. Flores. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Flores. So do we have any uh, comments? Do we have any public comments? My, my, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Liz. No, I just, I, I just, um, I guess I don't know why we're doing another motion when it's already being done. There's a satisfaction survey that's done for the partners after every one of the sessions. And it's also done um, whenever there's a, uh, unless something's changed, Marilee, isn't there a satisfaction survey that's done after any events that are uh, DD Council funded? Because that's the stuff that has to be reported back to the feds. Right. So this is already done, um, like Bambi highlighted earlier, and it's, Exactly like you're saying, as far as I understand, unless something has changed and I haven't been told. But so Courtney Ryland, who does our planning and monitoring, is the one that makes sure that these 
post-consumer surveys are created with the right questions and that they're sent out and she compiles that and she does something with it for federal requirements. So I, I would have to agree with Liz. I think it might even be confusing. Right, and that's what I'm worried about because there's plenty of surveys done so and it's already in there. And so this would make, would make, would make people believe that we don't already do that. And it's already right. being done by the council and partners because partners had their own evaluations plus then they had to do the satisfaction survey at the end of the six months so if you're doing it, you can do the satisfaction survey at the end of each um, uh, virtual process. thing. And that way you're having even more information because you're touching more people than just the 25 originals. So I'm, I don't think this is necessary personally. Thank you, Liz. Do we have any more comments? I'm trying to get my screen back to where I can see. But... Jill Haino has her hand raised, Mike. Thank you. Yes, Jill. Jill. Okay, I'm here. Um. Okay, so these. I'm getting confused. So for these 2021 sessions, we're talking about in everything. Like, are is it just? open or are we planning on having like a vetting process or is it a, like all welcome like how's the vetting gonna go for 2021 Mike, I can answer that if you want me to. Yes, please, Mary Lee. So Jill, based on the motion that passed, it it's a virtual- Oh, open to anyone who can join in. Never mind. Right. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. That was a long time ago. Can yeah. we correct that from the transcript, please? I, I'm not sure if the transcription is this year, but I will not put it in my minutes. Thank you. Hello. All right. Okay. So, did we have any? Uh, Nicole, was that a hand raised? Um, if it would cause confusion, if we're already doing this together, I'm, I'm withdraw my second. Um, since it confirms this already being done, I think that might have been Miranda's intention just to verify that we're doing that. If I could ask for them. Okay, so Nicole is withdrawing her second. Is there a second? Yes, Jane. Two One more time. Is there any second to the motion on the floor? Hearing none, the motion fails. All right, and just uh, uh, a timekeeping uh, moment here. We're at 1046, and we still have several agenda items left to go. Do you want me to go to the next one? Yes, please, Mary Lee. I'm trying to get my screen back. There we go. Can yeah. we put the agenda up, Mary Lee, please? Yeah. Like two seconds. Ebony will, I'm sure. If she's on the ball. Yep, there she is. Thank you, Ebony. So I'm first just gonna give an update on the contract between the council and families helping families at the crossroads. So um, the way it, it works is the council contracts with families helping families at the crossroads. And then families helping families at the crossroads contracts with a partner's coordinator. So Right now, the council does not have a contract with families helping families at the crossroads. 
And so unless something has changed that I'm not sure of, but Jim will say this in the next agenda item, families helping families at the crossroads doesn't have a contract with the coordinator because they don't have that funding to do so. As I understand it, and this was mentioned last meeting, Mr. Jim Sprinkle is compensating Adrian for her time and her effort on this committee. And I believe he paid her $500 for our first meeting. And I think he might be paying her $500 for this meeting because this committee was formed and she's working on it without a contract. Um, so, I, and I think you guys expressed at the last meeting that that was important to you. So I worked on a contract between the council and families helping families at the crossroads. Um, I, we got really close. Ultimately, the decision was made not to sign a contract with FHF at the crossroads because the 2020 class wasn't decided. And so the, I think the leadership was uncomfortable signing a contract when the 2020 class wasn't decided without a specific way to do the budget detail. And that's my update. I hope that that makes sense. Thank you, Mary Lee. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Liz? Um, yeah, Mary Lee, if you can expand on that. So what has Adrian been working um, I'm assuming she has because from the data that she provided and the PowerPoints and the information that she provided that she was in contact with the coordinators that she has been moving forward. So um, I, I guess I'm a little confused why it still, why the contract didn't even move forward as far as just for her salary and giving her some, um, some parameters to be working on to continue to be able to be paid towards it, even though that wasn't official with what was moving forward yet, at least the salary part as far as, I mean, I know you can't write the hotels and all those different things. So I guess I'm a little confused about that. So this, so in other words, October one is when this contract was not renewed. Is that what happened? That's yes. correct. That's correct. And at this point in time, they should, the contract should be reverted back to the original date so we can pay her up to date what she should be paying for doing what she's doing. Right at this point, we're just giving her a penance for hanging in there. And from a personal standpoint, if she was such a great person, I I would probably, uh, if I was in her shoes, I would be at question my staying around because the, the council needs to make that decision quickly because we, we can have a contract with her immediately. We could have the original contract and do it vaguely as, uh, so it could be adjusted according to the what's happening. Um, I know they all want to go forward and I'm willing, we're willing to put the money out. Uh, we, we are putting the money out and we're sending our second $500. And I am uh, i don't know the answer because I'm not the council, but they need to make a decision to sign the, you know, go ahead and put the contract out. I believe Mary Lee has the data for the contract and uh, adjusted accordingly to cover the COVID. I think that's in the generic terms that we would adjust for COVID. It has to be general because you can't say specifically at that point. But the main thing is to get Adrian back on pay, give her her full salary going back to the start of this contract because she's been working the whole time. Yeah, because in 2016, when we moved forward with the regional um, meetings and not the full one, we just they just amended the contract to be less money and focus more on um, covering, making sure that it continued to move forward and the salaries were covered and then just amended the mileage and all that kind of stuff. So, sure. I, I, so is it something, Marilee, that um, is it something that they can go back, they're going to be able to retroactive this back to October 1 once the EC approves possibly what we requested in the motion so that they can get this back in check? So, <laughs> About I, above your pay grade, right? A little. I'll give you my best answer. Um, I do know that if it's decided to sign a contract with FHF, she has agreed to backdate it to October 1. Okay. 
Um, and then I'm not sure how that would work between the 500 and, and then the salary that would be not really under my business. That would be more right, between right. Jim and his employee, which is the coordinator. Um, it would make sense. It would make sense to me to sign a contract with FHF. The council approved this budget um, for partners. Right, right. I think it it was nine, it was 80 and then it was 90 that your last year, Liz. And I don't remember right. if they kept it at 90 or put it back to they 80. They did. I'm pretty sure they did kept it at 90. It's okay. 90. The thing is, Marilee, is, is that, um, you know, they approved it for 90. That doesn't mean you have to move forward with 90 if you're not having the same format, but the contract can be written in the sense that it's more catered to the specifics of um, what that's going on. I, I just I, I just need to make a statement as a former coordinator, knowing the information that she presented um, from the standpoint of going through the data and all this different stuff and looking at, I'm going to tell you, that the data that she presented breaking down the different regions that she did and looked at and all that stuff, that wasn't an easy task. That information that I had to pass on that I had been given in the past was, was hard to break all that information down. So she did a lot of work on getting this information to be able to get you your stats and stuff like that. So I just, and, and then contacting and connecting. Adrian, are you connected now with the other coordinators in the other states where they have those little monthly meetings? They used to do a monthly meeting where they all would talk about what was going on and stuff. Have you connected with them? On um, that? We have connected, but uh, some of those meetings, I connected with the, with the young lady that kept the, uh, the national Facebook page. And she said that they were in a little pause on a few things, but they were working very, um, trying to work to get all of those things back together. Right now, uh, Kathy Snow, I know you know who that is. Um, uh -huh. She's doing, uh, I I've, I've have to submit to her, she's doing the data collection for the Minnesota uh, Disabilities Council, who, you know, of course, right. uh, for those who don't know, they have the trademark and the ownership of the Partners in Policy Making Program. So they're capturing the nationwide data. So th I think a lot of it may be due to Kathy is actually uh, putting that together. And so I, I know she's waiting on my report that uh, covers some other uh, stats that I'm working on and actually also to uh, capture uh, as our, uh, as our, uh, uh, you know, you had to have like a, a, a story, not a story or highlights of what has happened. And so my highlight is to uh, focus on, and I'm, I'm speaking prematurely because I'm getting ready to send that to Mary Lee, uh, Jim and Courtney uh, that highlights the uh, April Dunn Act that was created this year. I can make a com comment that there's no reason in my mind the contract couldn't be put in place as it usually is with the comment that uh, as to, it is adjusted according to the COVID situation so that if there's uh, 50,000 for travel, for example, and 10,000 for speakers, you know, that, that amount of money doesn't have to be spent. And as we get, go through the, ter the time period, say come March, things aren't right, you could always make an adjustment, an amendment to the contract to downsize that amount of money and put it somewhere else so you don't lose it. Am, am I right, Mary Lee? Yes. Uh, so I, if you put the contract forward as is, with the says to be adjusted according to COVID situations, then all we have to do when we see a problem is make an amendment to the contract, take the money out of that fund if it's 10000 and put it in whatever the council decides to do for that year. And that way you could run smooth. And if it goes good, you spend the money. If it doesn't go good, you have an option to put it somewhere else. Yes. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if it answers your question, Liz. Well, well, is, was it the, de who determined not to continue the contract? Was it the council members? No. Um, oh, okay. No, the council funded it, like I said. Um, okay. Poorly? What's that? 
Corley, was it? Courtney. Courtney, excuse me. Yeah, so she's the acting, the interim executive director. So that, that's, she's, she has this signing authority. And but she um, doesn't want to do it unless the council approves. Is that right? No, I don't, I didn't understand it that way, but I know Mr. Jim's, you, I think you might have spoken to her recently and I wasn't in on the conversation. So maybe she shared that with you. But what I understood was what I said earlier. She's not comfortable signing a contract with FHF if the 2020 class isn't decided because she thinks it will be difficult to do the budget detail if she doesn't know what we're doing with the 2020 class. Um, I It was my recommendation and I, I left it solely up to her because it's, it's her authority and under her purview, but it would make sense to me just to sign a contract with FHF and you're at least paying the, that way FHF can at least pay the coordinator, the coordinator's monthly salary. And then if you don't spend travel and meals and hotels and whatever else, then you don't spend it. And exactly like Jim said, and I think you said the same thing, Liz. And then later, yeah, and, I yeah. mean, like, that's, and the contract was amended. You know, it wasn't the regular contract, which was, you'll do six informational sessions and you'll arrange hotel and all right. those things. It was amended for COVID. So that's, that's kind of why you know? right at the beginning, I wanted to focus on making a decision, making some decisions. That way, if they go and they're approved, then maybe we'll be able to get a contract done. Do we know how long before the executive committee is going to meet? I'm sorry, Mike, I, I, I'm done. <laughs> I don't, no, uh, I don't know. And that's where I that's where I was going to go was I think this will quickly resolve itself once that these were brought before the executive committee. Um, I don't have a schedule with the next meeting. Uh, but they can meet whenever they want. Right. That's, you know, uh, just as long as we have enough. Do it public do it quickly now. Yes. And I don't know if that covered the next agenda item which was really Mr. Jim's, which is just an update on I mean, the, between FHF. The contract will be very, contract can be very versatile. It could be amended at a moment's notice if things go wrong. If you just put it out as it is, whatever normal is, with the exception that to be adjusted according to the COVID condition, we are perfectly willing on our end to sign off of, on any amendments that addresses that. And you're going to have to have the possibility of those amendments because whatever money you don't spend, I think they say you lose it. Is that right? So it has to be transferred into some other program before the end of the fiscal year. Am I right, Mary Lee? That is really, I don't know the exact answer to that. I've heard both mixed answers on that if you lose it or if you don't lose it. So I don't want to answer that. I'm not. I think you have three good. years to spend the federal funds. Bambi would years. know, or I, I could call Sean. I call him for all my budget questions. <laughs> I suspect that the executive committee is going to move rather quickly and that it should get to the executive director to get sorted out uh, rather quickly. That's uh, well, good. Please do. Either, but I'm, I'm sure that was the intent. We will cover. We will cover her until such time this happens, because I don't want to lose her time. We we got a gym here, so understood. That's not lose. And understood. I just want to say on the record, I really appreciate Adrian's efforts in sticking it out. Um, it would have been very difficult for me to do this without Adrian. Like you said, Liz, all those pieces that she did in her presentation, I would have had to do, or they may not have been there, and. Again, we, um, we're working in a really um, understaffed office right now. And as, so far as, as far as the contract with her, with Adrian, it's going to be simple on our end because we are going to copy the wording that's already in the DDC contract as far as deliverables adjusted for COVID. <laughs> okay, so uh, Karanda uh, has her hand up. 
Go ahead, Corona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to um, make a motion for this topic to go directly to the executive committee um, to be heard and acted on as expeditiously as possible. In regards to um, paying Ms. Thomas's salary, um, as well as um, whether or not you will enter into a contract with the families helping families at the crossroads. So I'm just gonna give you this information and I don't know if it might help you because uh, with your motion, but we as a council don't pay the coordinator or do it's that. It's for, the, we for both contracts. Yeah, you have to get the contract with me first so right. I can do a contract with her. And then she right. is actually a uh, contractor underneath our purview and we're responsible for what she does. So our purview as a council would be to create a contract with families helping families at the crossroads for partners. Can we phrase it just like you just said, uh, Ms. Andrews? Oh, for to recommend, to recommend it to the um, executive council executive to act at, yeah, to the executive committee, my apologies, to act as expeditiously as possible um, on addressing the contract with the families helping families at the crossroads as it relates to partners and policy making. Okay, give me one second and I'll share. What region is FHF Crossroads in? The center of the state. Oops. In uh, Pineville. Okay. So I'm just going to share this really quick. And it is 11.05. So after this, Mike, you can decide if you want to ask people to stay on or if you want to maybe push these to something else. Yeah, yeah, because I'm I'm uh, rapidly approaching a work meeting as well. So but let's move ahead with this one. Okay, so uh, we have currently a motion on the floor for uh, to for the executive committee to act as expeditiously as possible in signing a contract with families helping families at the crossroads for partners policy making. Do we have a second on the motion? I'll second it. Jill Hanno seconds. Do we have any comments? I abstain. Mike, I have a question. Okay, um, who was who abstained? Miss Flores abstained. Sure. And Liz, you go ahead. You have the floor. Yeah, my question. My question though is: is, that, is it the executive committee that me needs to act when it wasn't them who? I, do they even know that the contract hadn't been signed? Are they even aware that there was no contract between families helping families and the DD Council? Because it was. It sounded like it was staff. Uh, the interim executive director and not EC. So is it more a motion need to be done or more that they just need to tell the ED to get it moving or do they have to approve the other things first in order to do it? Is it necessary, I guess, is the question. Yeah, and I don't know if Mary Lee would speak better, but I believe that the, that the first two motions that we approved earlier, which gave the direction of where we were going to go with the current uh, class and the next class, um, kind of gives them the direction that they need to approve the budgeting and the contract. And Mary Lee, if you have something other or something to add, I would welcome it. Um, I, I, you're right, Liz. I think, as I understand it, if if I'm able to give this information to the executive director and then she will give it to the executive committee, then they will, 
and they approve it, they approve these motions, then the interim executive director will be comfortable signing a contract. And that is a good point. Um, I'm not sure what the executive committee would do if they got that directive, because I, I'm not sure that, they, I think they'd probably be thinking, I'm, we're not even in charge of this. Didn't we fund this as a council? Those are really important events. I have a question. Is all of this still going to be hinging on the details of the 2020 PIP class, the budgetary concerns? Because I, I wouldn't want to see anything hold up Adrian's contract at this point. It sounds like it's already been in the balance for a while. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of details that need to be worked out. Um, but how do we make sure that that's not something that trips this up again? So I think you're asking, how do we make sure that the details of the 2020 class doesn't further hinder the signing of the contract? Yes. Um, I mean, I can... is that why she um, kind of passed on it in the first place, the, the 2020 budget? No. I don't think so. It was just a decision-making process. A contract had to be signed. All, all that could be worked into that contract based on COVID adjustments. So in my mind, subject to COVID adjustments would cover everything. That's just a financial perspective of, you know, handling the money. It's and we're completely open to anything. I mean, we'll pay, pay your salary for the next four or five months if I have to, but they got to make a decision sooner or later and put it in writing. Yeah, and 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 once again, I think we've uh, made the referral to the executive committee on this, the path for the current class and the next class for part right. of the policy making. So I think that all, all should resolve. Uh, with the next DC meeting. And I'm sure Randall will move quickly to schedule that. So, so um, we still have a question on the floor and uh, so far have not heard. Uh, we do have a second and we have Ms. Flores has abstained. So do we have um, uh, any other discussion? Do we have any objections? Yes, Liz. Liz Gary. Yeah, I object because I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think that the executive committee is supposed to be enforcing a contract. I think they should be working with the staff to do that. So I, I, I object. Thank you. So um, Mary Lee, can you do a roll call vote? Jill Hano. Yes. Bambi Polizola. I agree with Liz, but I'm, I'm going to vote yes. Miss Corley. Yes. Miss Flores. Abstain. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Miss Gilliland? Yes. And Miss Gary? No. Okay, so that's four yeas, one nay, and one abstention. I might make make a comment to get to Mr. to Liz. I I agree with you 100, percent but I feel like that something needs to give some kind of a push, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I, I think that's a motion's good. No, I totally respect that, Jim. I I I'm just saying in the sense that if we're 
you know, it didn't even sound like the executive committee was aware of that not being done. And if we're moving forward and we're saying, go do the 2020, go do 2021, then there's no reason why they shouldn't have been moving forward with it on it anyway. And so that was You're my right. whole thing of saying that. Absolutely. So it's not, it's not that I'm against it. I am all for you getting funded and Adrian getting her money as soon as I'm possible. I just didn't think that was necessary. Thanks. You're right. You're absolutely right. But somebody's got to do the punch. <laughs> Maybe it'll make them make an impression. Heck, hey, we, we got to get something done. Okay, so that uh, motion carried. Um, and now. What I was thinking too, like, I mean, this is the motivator to get the ball rolling because it sounds to me that. This is just like a technical issue on paperwork not being signed. So I think that this, and I agree with Liz as well, but I think this will be maybe a push into gaining back into the DDC contract with Mr. Jim and then Mr. Jim gaining the contract with partners and then everything will be set to go on to get Miss Adrian paid and everything is all on the right track, correct? Right, from my standpoint. Okay. And can I have another Question, Mr. Mike. You can have one more question, Jill. <laughs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> okay, so just to make sure my thoughts are correct, the process is we have the contract with FHFA Crossroads and then FHF and Crossroads has the contract with PIP. So like we pay you for you to pay PIP, correct? Exactly, Jill. We pay, we give Mr. Jim $90,000 and we say, this is for you to do partners in policymaking. Okay. And then with that $90,000, he spends part of that on paying and compensating a PIP coordinator who right now, I mean, we don't have a PIP coordinator right now, but it's, it was Adrian the last time we had a contract and she's doing that work right now. Right. And then he uh -oh. uses that money for travel, meals, respite, childcare. Can we see in black and white, and I'm going against Ms. Term Billings, I'm very sorry. Um, can we see a document of the breakdown of our but? Big contract with Crossroads. The con uh, contract does have a budget details that can, like I said, could be adjusted according to COVID. It, it'll have so much for transportation, for example, which is a biggie. So right. much for training. Uh, Mary Lee knows more about that than I do, and so does Liz. But uh, the biggest thing I'm concerned about is having the money, it could be sitting there. We may not spend it, but at least I'll be able to pay her salary. Correct. 
So Jill, <laughs> I can't give you that now because like like we all know there's no contract right now, but I can maybe show you last year's and you can kind of see what it looks like. Okay. Well you email that to me. I will. Thank you. And um Mr. Billings. Thank yes. you. Ms. Mr. I'm Billings. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say it's 1118. Um, we have really three more agenda items. The self-advocates virtual accommodations for 2020, ITAC disparities, and then future agenda items. So it might be a good idea to take those three and put it on the next meeting's agenda and do public comment and yeah. then close. I mean, that's really up to y'all, but it's 1118. I just don't know how fair it is to ask people to stay longer that maybe didn't plan on it, including the public. I think there's- Yes, people. and I have, I have an 1130 commitment, so I'm kind of pressed for time as well. So. Me too. Yeah. Liz, I see I you have your hand up. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to wait because some of those things are going to be ones that can be addressed once the EC approves moving forward because some of those things are issues that we can make plans for how to make sure that those are actually captured once it's approved. So I, I don't see any reason why we should continue forward on those. We can wait. So basically, we can't. So are we trying to push our next meeting till after the executive committee meets? Um, Jill, Jill, that was a question and you were out of questions. <laughs> I don't know that I would schedule it that way. As the housekeeper of this committee, I think we should just schedule it like we normally do and when we meet, um, I mean, I can communicate that if we're meeting on a certain date, that perhaps the executive committee can meet prior. But if we wait for the executive committee to meet and they that they end up not meeting, we might be waiting for a long time. That's, right. That would be my good point. Suggestion. So, um, Miss Corley, you have your hand up. I'm going to give you just a minute because we need to decide what we're going to do here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a motion that we table these uh, remaining agenda items to the next uh, meeting and, and then make the motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. So are you seconding the first one or the second one? <laughs> seconded that quick. I didn't even get a second. <laughs> um, she just made a motion. Karanda made a motion to table the remaining items to the next meeting, and I second that. All right. Thank you. Do we have any comment? Do we have any objections? Any abstentions? So that motion carries. Um, and so the only thing we have to do is future agenda items. Well, we'll just put these. These will be our future be, agenda yeah. items. But I think we should check for public comment just to stay true to Absolutely. our public meetings laws. Yes. And then, Ms. Corley, you could make the second part of your motion to adjourn if you wanted. So I'm not sure. But, um, Ebony or Hannah, do we have any more public comment? Just one from Harlan. He says, please contact me if I can help in any way. Thanks. Thank you, Harlan. There are no hands raised from the public. Thank you. Ms. Corley, you have the floor. I would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. A motion on the floor to adjourn. Do we have a second? I second. Do we have any objections? Hearing none, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for Thank you. Uh, giving your time today. I'll schedule the next meeting in the same format, guys.
Thank Thanks, you. Marilee. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mary Lee and Tiffany. Uh, have a good day. Yeah, have a great and wonderful day. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ms. Bye-bye. Yeah, well. I can't leave. Nice, okay.